course of the three days also that we are going to not just dwell in the Psalms, but we're going to look at all the other uh, verses and chapters in the Bible that connect with the Psalms, because they're very related and very much relate to us, the mind of Christ. Brother Thomas said, These Psalms are full to overflowing of things pertaining to Christ. They celebrate his sufferings, his resurrection, his exaltation, his heroism, his kingly glory, the splendor of his dominion that is to be, the resurrection of the dead, the fall of the Antichrist, the benignity of his reign, the overthrow of the nations, the restoration of Israel, the riches of the world, etc. All these things and more they set forth the admiration and inspiration of the diligent student of the sure prophetic word. In our first psalm for consideration, we'll look at the psalms of the Son of Man. We want to see in these psalms how he had dominion over the flesh, how he had dominion over sin, how he had dominion over carnal things. Lord willing, we will progress through to Sunday to see our Lord Jesus Christ in His suffering and the glory that would follow. I had a handout that I passed out to you, and I'm not going to dwell specifically on that handout. It's because this is going to be probably a little bit deeper study, and I probably will go over things maybe a little too quickly, which I've been known to do. So it's more for your reference for later or maybe to refer to if you miss something on the way through. There needed to be two ingredients to be in place for us to be able to look at the Psalms which we want to consider today, and that's Psalm 8 and Psalm 80. And by the way, I just wanted to mention also that there are three books that were loaned to me that cover the Psalms from Psalm uh, 1 to 107, and they're very valuable books if you get an opportunity. I don't know if we have them in our library, but certainly ask our sister Eileen to uh, check into it for you, but they're very helpful books uh, in studying the Psalms. So they assisted me along with other materials, so the material I am giving you this morning is a presentation of that material. So we had two ingredients for the Son of Man to have dominion over sin. So we have to understand these two things as we proceed through, not only today, but also for the next three days. The first thing is that one bearing our nature might have the means to overcome it every moment of his life until he destroyed that nature when he hung upon the cross. The second thing is, there needed to be an enthusiastic willingness to be at one with the Father in mind and in purpose, even to go as far as dying on the cross, which was against his own will. Without these two ingredients, there would never have been dominion over sin, as we will see. The dominion that was lost by Adam in the garden would have never been recovered by the son of Adam. This is called, as we will see in Psalm 8, the son of Adam, or Bena Adam. We'll see this throughout this talk. So we want to look at the Psalms that refer to him in this way, the son of man. We'll see that in these Psalms were the thoughts of our Lord Jesus Christ every day of his life, he would have seen in Psalm 8 the work that he was to achieve in fulfilling his Father's will. And we see by further study that Asaph also used this term quite frequently, Son of Man, especially in Psalm 80, which we will dip into and consider as well today. The term Son of Man, we will have to come to realize, does not refer to Christ as being identified with the human race. That is to say, that because he was born of Mary, he was called the Son of Man. That is not correct. But instead, we want to look at this Son of Man referring to his divine, delegated authority to exercise dominion over carnal things. 
And we know that David knew this, and that Asaph knew this in Psalm 80. He was to do what the first Adam did not do, and that was have dominion over sin every day of his life. And ultimately we know that because of this, he was given dominion over all things. If we look at uh, Psalm 80, verse 17, it says, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man, ben Adam, whom thou madest strong for thyself. This is not talking about Jesus' humanity, but that God visited this man, as we read in our reading, Psalm 8, verse 4. He visited him to strengthen him for a purpose, and that was to have dominion over sin, to have dominion over carnal things. We find that in reading Ezekiel, the son, the, not the son, but the son of man is used 92 times. Ezekiel begins with the vision of the cherubim. We remember the opening chapters of Ezekiel, and then it shows us at the end what the house of prayer for all nations. So we look at Ezekiel and it proceeds with the words, Son of man, set thy face against Gog and Magog. What it is showing is that it is a demonstration of dominion over carnal things. Magog and Magog. The conquest of sin that is to be. So we want to look at a couple of passages in the New Testament before we consider our psalm. We want to look at uh, Luke chapter 5. I have hopefully most of the uh, quotes on the overhead in front of you to save you time a little bit of looking things up. In Luke chapter 5, the phrase the Son of Man shows up 85 times. And not once does it contain the idea of humanity. Divine delegated authority to act as God on earth. In verse 20, he forgives the man that was let down through the roof. If you remember the incident, the man was let down through the roof on a bed, and Jesus said to him, your sins are forgiven you. But now, the Pharisees started to question him in regards to this. And Jesus said, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath authority upon earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, to thee I say, Arise, take up thy couch, and be going on thy way to the house. He's showing that he hath authority from heaven. So it's not that the Son of Man is because he's born of Mary. It's showing that his authority given to him by God. In John chapter 5, verses 17 to 27, again we see this. He was being accused of trying to be equal with God at the time. So we pick it up in verse 19. He said, Then answered Jesus, and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. Verse 21. For as the Father raiseth up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. Verse 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father, which hath sent him. This was his answer to those who questioned him, questioned his authority, because they thought he was trying to be equal with God, but he was really telling them that he was the manifestation of God. I guess the question would be, how would we try to uh, answer those around us that were accusing us of different things? Maybe we would have said, uh, hey, I'm the Son of God. But I had a little more clout. You know, don't talk to me that way. I am the Son of God. But he didn't. Here's what he says in verse 27. And I've given him authority to execute judgment also, because why? He is the Son of Man. This is how he answered the Pharisees as they accused him of being equal with. So let's take a look at this. How did this come to be written? Well, let's go back to our psalm for consideration, one that was read out of Psalm 8. And Psalm 8 really is tied in with Psalm 7 and Psalm 9. They're both together, really. Psalm 7, 8, and 9, they all flow together. 
Chapter 9 in your margin or in your uh, title might say to the chief musician upon Muth Laban. And Muth Laban means the death of the champion. I think you probably know where we're going to go with this little story. Here we have a psalm written by David about the death of Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. And isn't it interesting then that we're talking about dominion over sin and over carnal things that we take ourselves to David and Goliath. Now, Goliath, with Laban, means the death of the champion. Uh, Goliath had the number six written all over him. Uh, he had, what was it, six fingers and six toes, the weight. He had brass all around him. He represents sin in its ultimate sense. And he was taunting the Israelites and blaspheming the God of Israel. And at that time, the Ecclesia, we could say, or Israel, were in disarray. They really didn't have true leadership. Otherwise, somebody would have gone out and attacked this giant. So here is an opportunity then to represent the greater work that was to come through Christ. And this is where this will all culminate. Goliath said that he was going to feed David's flesh to the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the earth. But you know, David's mind flashed back to Genesis 1. David said, And I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air, to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. You know, the language of Genesis 1 is the same as Psalms 8, verses 6 to 8. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth, through all the paths of the seas. And after David put that rock in the sling and swung it around, around and around, and it hit the giant right in the forehead, we have to wonder, what did he do? Well, we look at these words. David came and stood on the neck of the giant. David had exercised dominion over sin. He had exercised dominion over what would represent carnal things. He told Saul of this already. I can do this. I've slain the beast. I've slain the bear. I've slain the lion. I can do this. And so dominion also was given to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that also was to be exercised in himself first by the crucifixion of the flesh. You know, brethren and sisters, David saw all of that. What happened after he stood on the neck? He ran over to the giant. <laughs> he pulled out the sword and he cut off his head. It says in the Bible. But what did he do? You or I, we would have probably just tossed that thing or grabbed it like a bowling ball. But he didn't. He chopped off his head and he picked it up. And then he started to walk with it. Where did he go? They were in the valley of Elah. If we look, it says he places the head in Jerusalem. The place, I believe, the place of the skull. The Golgotha. Outside the walls of Jebus. It says, And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. Why was this? How did he know to do this? Why would he know to put the head of Goliath in Jerusalem? I believe that he understood Genesis chapter 14 and Genesis chapter 22. 
He knew the place. He knew the place where Melchizedek dwelt as the priest of the Most High God. That that place was going to be the same place as the seat of Christ's kingdom. He knew that Christ would reign as king priest, but only after a great sacrifice was accomplished. And he knew about the sacrifice that took place in Genesis chapter 22, and that it took place right in that area. So he deliberately took the head that represented sin into enemy territory at that time. And he placed it in that particular area. His mind was in Genesis chapter 1. It is no wonder, brethren and sisters, that God called David a man after his own heart. He had thought this all out. He knew about Genesis. He thought like God, and he acted like God. Just the same as if we would call someone a man after our own heart. Their mind, their thought, and their purpose would all be in tune with ours. And that's what David was. In verse 26, we read, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. Do you notice here when I read it, it says, Let us make man, Adam, in our image? And do you notice where it says, let them have dominion over the fish. I just want you to store that away, this verse, in your minds. We're going to come back to this. The word dominion here means to tread underfoot. It is from the Greek word rada. In Psalm 8, it also uses the word dominion. It is from the Hebrew word mashal, and it means to have trodden underfoot. So we see that radah is the process of treading underfoot, and mashal is the end of the process. David knew this, and he understood this. Where he saw the loss of dominion by Adam, he would have also looked forward to the regaining of dominion by the son of Adam, Benham, Adam. He knew the only way that it could happen was the fulfillment of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, which we're all familiar with, and that is the crushing of the head of the serpent. Interesting, isn't it? He takes the head of the giant, Goliath, to the very place where the crushing of the head of the serpent was to take place. All of them. He knew that Jesus would have dominion. He wrote of this very first, this very verse in the psalm under consideration, almost word for word. We look at the next verse in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, where it says, And God created the man, the man, in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over all the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moveth on the land. We notice in our King James Version, for those of you who have one in front of you, it says, so God created man in his own image. This is actually more correctly rendered, the man, as we see by the arrow pointing out. The first Adam being a type of the second Adam. We read in 1 Corinthians, 
15, verse 45, it says, Thus also it is written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. Looking at those two verses we just considered, the last thing that God did on the sixth day of creation, Yahweh performed His final work. He created the woman, taken out of the side of man. And after which, on the seventh day, it says, He rested. These two were unique in that together they might manifest the character of their father who had made them. They were a united couple, bonded together. And when Yahweh rested on the seventh day, they would have exercised dominion. How do we really know this? How do we know they exercised dominion on the seventh day? We look at creation, as we do, as being a type or a symbol for the future, or the days of the thousands of years that have gone by, we are looking at the sixth day right now. The day is almost over. The Gentile times are about to expire. And when it does, brethren and sisters, it will be the son of Adam, Benna Adam, with his bride that will exercise dominion together while Yahweh and his angels rest on the seventh day. We, we with Christ, will exercise dominion, bonded together with him in unity of mind and purpose, just the same as the first Adam was with his wife. And so when we look back to verse 26, we see the word them, let them have dominion, over the sea, we are seeing that it means Christ and His bride. They will have dominion on that seventh day. And so will we, brethren and sisters, with Christ. We will assist Him in a new creation. As it says in verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. Replenish the earth. Isn't it true, as we look at the world around us, that it will need to be replenished. With what? With the word of Yahweh. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth on the earth. Can we see this picture before us, brethren and sisters? It's where the mind of David was. The man after God's own heart. He was in the kingdom. And that's what Psalm 8 is about. We want to have a look at Psalm 8, but before we do, we want to look at some of the New Testament quotes that show where we're going with this. So I'd like to look at first one is in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 24 to 28. It says, Then cometh the end, the end of the Sabbath day, the end of the millennium, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. Where is Paul getting this from? Well, he's quoting Psalm 8. And probably verse 6. We, spit, we take a little bit of notice here of Paul's use of a couple of words in particular. Uh, the one word we want to look at is the word, keep Greek word pa, which is all. We find that is used ten times in this. The other one is hupo, which is under. And he uses that eight times. But when he said, all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. When all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. All will be like God. All will be immortal. 
10 is the number for all. 10 is the number for perfect spiritual order. And of course, the number 8 we know to be the number for immortality. Psalm 8 is about the millennium. When he is saying that all things will be put under his feet and he will have dominion over all carnal things, mortality will then will disappear. In Hebrews chapter 2, in verse 5, he says, For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. Again, speaking of the millennium. It is Christ and his bride that have dominion. Remember, the angels will rest with God. Verse 6, But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? That's from Psalm 8, verse 4. He continues to quote again from verses 4 to 8 of Psalms 8. We read here in verse 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. Verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, through suffering. We notice the similarity of the language of Psalm 8 and Corinthians in Paul's writing. But Psalm 8 isn't fulfilled yet, is it, brothers and sisters? Christ hasn't got his bride yet. And so we are still awaiting for the fulfillment of this song. He's not exercising dominion in the Sabbath day. If we go back to Psalm 8, we take a look here at the first and the last verse of this psalm, which are identical to the Hebrews. In verse 6, we find that he's talking about us. If you take a look at it in your Bibles, it says where he says, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. We'd like to recall to mind now those verses that I said store away just for a moment. The him, if we remember in Genesis, was talking about them. Male and female created he them. It is Christ and his bride. And if that's the case, then we are included in verses 1 and 9. Where he says, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. O Yahweh, our Adenogen. The Hebrew word here is actually rulers. It's a plural form of the Adon, which means ruler. So really it should read, O Yahweh, our rulers. When it is fulfilled, it won't be just Adam that has dominion, it will be with his bride that he shares this dominion. O oh, he who will become rulers, how excellent, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. What an important psalm this was for our Lord Jesus Christ to read and study as he was growing up. What would he have seen in this psalm? Well, in verse 4 it says, What is man? What is Enosh? That thou art mindful of him. What is weak, mortal man? When he stood in front of the giant, he knew, David knew, that he was weak. And he would have said, what am I to you that you are going to remember me in the situation that I'm in right now? And then he says, and what is the son of man? Bena Adam that thou visitest him. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies. Here's the answer, brethren, sisters, friends. It was the spirit of utter dependence upon Yahweh that led to David's victory. 
we look up Luke chapter 10, verse 17, it says, And the seventy, seventy being the number of the Gentiles, returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. If we take a quick note, you don't have to look it up, but in Luke chapter 9, he sent out 12 people. And in this chapter, he sent out 70. And if we remember that number 12 is the number for Israel, and the number 70 is for the Gentiles, so we would see to the Jew first, and then to the Gentile. What do they say in verse 17, these 70 when they come back? They say, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Lord, supreme authority. They are subject to hupoteso. Paul uses this term in 1 Corinthians 15 from the quote of Psalms 8 where it says, to put things under. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power or delegated authority to tread. Notice these words, to tread upon. Thou hast put all things under his feet. What was the first thing they were to tread upon? Serpents. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. These are the rulers that he's mentioning in Psalm 8, verses 1 and 9. Those who have already learned to have dominion over carnal things, and how through an utter dependence upon God. He uses six things here in these verses that belong to the flesh. Just like Goliath was filled with the number six. He continues on. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit. He jumped for joy and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes. Where is this coming from, brothers and sisters? O Yahweh, Adenonim, how excellent and majestic is thy name in all the earth. When I consider the heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, those who are utterly dependent upon your strength. All things, all things are delivered to me of my Father. And no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal himself. Psalm 8, verse 6. The word Father appears here five times. We know the story when David went out to meet Goliath, knowing that he was this weak, frail man, went out with utter dependence upon Yahweh, symbolized by the five smooth stones that he chose. It would have represented the mind of Yahweh operating on the mind of David. You can do this. I will help. I just want to fill out the rest of the story here from Psalm 80. And if you just turn to Psalm 80 with me. Beginning at verse 1. He says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength, and come and save us. We are in the Psalms of the Son of Man, and here we see Joseph mentioned. Here before you on the slide is the encampment of the tribes of Israel. And we notice on the western side, Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. That's where they're located. They're directly behind the tabernacle and the most holy places in this area. But notice in Psalm 80, look at that, verse 2. 
before Ephraim, Benjamin, and Manasseh. Look at the slide in front of you now. He has gone and intentionally changed the order. Why is that? Benjamin now is placed in the middle. Well, his name means son of the right hand. And we notice in verse 17 it says, Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man whom thou hast made strong for thyself. It's talking about Benjamin. So Benjamin, as we see, has been placed right in the middle behind the ark. Why? Well, it's because he is the ark. He is the son of the right hand. And on either side of him, he has Ephraim and Manasseh. Verse 1, Thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. He is specifically talking about the placement of Benjamin behind the cherubim. So who do they represent, this Ephraim and Manasseh? Well, the two families that represent the Bride of Christ, but at different stages, one at the beginning of the millennium and one at the end. If we look at Manasseh, it means causing to forget or forgetting. We can see this being a, nat a, a reference to natural Israel. We remember that Ma Manasseh was the natural firstborn to Joseph. But remember when they were being blessed, when Jacob stuck his hands out to bless them, he crossed his hands over intentionally when he blessed them. And he placed his right hand on the younger boy, Ephraim. Like natural Israel, they were always forgetting their God. Because they forgot their God, we look at Jeremiah 2.32, and it says, Can a maid forget her ornaments, or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. And because of this very thing, Jesus says in Matthew, Therefore say unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Isn't it interesting, brethren and sisters, that Ephraim happens to mean double fruit. He is a type of spiritual Israel. In Genesis 48, 19, where the blessing came, he says, and his father refused and said, I know, I know, my son. He, Manasseh, also shall become a people. He also shall be great. But truly, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Where is that from? That is from Genesis chapter 17. It's promised to Abraham, I have made thee a father of a multitude. So let's put this all together here then. In John chapter 3 and 4, we have the work of Christ as the son of the right hand, leading Ephraim and Manasseh. If we look at verse 13 of John, it says, And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Is this about his humanity or divinely delegated authority? This is divine delegated authority. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Sin must be crushed. That whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. And that's why he called himself the Son of Man. He was dealing with a nation that needed to be saved. And yet there was only a very few that would grasp the word. The whole nation had forgotten about God. We talked about that in our readings last night. Nicodemus was an example of this. If we look at John chapter 3, verse 9, we see that Nicodemus answered and said unto him, 
How can all these things be? I was talking to Christ. How can these things be? We look at the answer Jesus gave. He said, Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? And you don't know these things? You have forgotten. And in the next chapter, in John chapter 4, he was in Samaria. These people thought they were from Ephraim and Manasseh. They inhabited the area of Ephraim, but they were Gentiles. How do we know they were Gentiles? Well, if we look at Luke 17, it says, And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers and stood afar off. They lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. So here we know he's a Samaritan. Jesus answering said, Were there not ten cleansed? Who are the nine? Verse 18. They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. If we go to the strongest concordance for the word stranger, we find it to mean foreign, that is, not a Jew. That tells us the Samaritans then were Gentiles. So we go back to John chapter 4, verse 5. He says, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob left, or gave to his son Joseph. Psalm 80, remember, talked about the shepherd of Israel leading Joseph like a flock. Then he says he put the son of the right hand right in the middle of Manasseh and Ephraim. John chapter 3 is talking about Manasseh. John chapter 4 is Ephraim. Here Jesus is now turning to the Gentiles. He has dealt with the Nicodemus type of person, the Jews that had forgotten you would try to remain faithful. He's turning to them to the Gentiles who were willingly come to, coming to his word. Look at verse 42 of that same chapter. The men were talking to the woman, and they said to her, Now we believe, not because of your saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Joseph, also, remember, was given a name by Pharaoh after bringing in double fruit to save the world at that time. That name was Zaphna Panea, which, brethren and sisters, happens to mean the Savior of the world. Thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, the son of the right hand, the man who God made strong for himself, he's got Manasseh. And those few people who would respond to that, and he's got many Gentiles who come willingly, who want to exercise dominion over carnal things. And so it says in John chapter 3, verse 35, The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hands, Nasa and Ephraim, those who would come to him. Christ, Ben Adam, with his bride, operating with the divine delegated authority, has all things in his hand. And so it will be, brethren and sisters, in that coming day, may we all, through his grace and mercy, share in the kingdom of the Father, to be able to exercise dominion with him in his kingdom on that seventh day. God willing, we will look to look tomorrow at how we and exercise dominion during our